So welcome to our first, okay. Welcome to our first ever graduate workshop. Uh, we're SPS and we will be hosting another version of this. So look out for that as well. Okay. Uh, our main takeaway from this, we hope you will have is, is grad school right for you? Is it an option that you wanna look into? And what are the steps that you can take if it is something you wanna look at? So grad school is all about original research. It is not only about learning, you do like specialize in a field, but it's mostly about applying those concepts in subfields or whatever field you want to work in. So your end goal for a PhD is original contributions to a field. So they, it is very important that you actually go about it in that sense, like you understand that you will be producing original work and presenting it um, to a board, which is later, but presenting it as papers and things to the scientific community. All right, so say you're considering grad school and you want to know what you can do right now to help your chances at getting in, getting applying, just things like that. The main, the main thing I can't trust this enough is research. It is very, very important. Um, you're at USC, it's a research institution and we have tons of research opportunities. So utilize as much of those as you can. Um, it's never too late, really, but it's great as early as you can start just so you can explore more. And I'll go a little bit into what research looks like in a little in the next slide. Um, but other than that, improving your GPA is super important for more reasons than one. Uh, we've speak, spoken to a little We've spoken to a few of professors who are on the admissions community and we will tell you what they said, but basically your GPA is also one of the like markers that they're going to use to distinguish between applications between you and others. Um, they usually say that it is holistic, so they will see every part of your application, but GPA plays a huge role. So if you can take as many like classes you can do as well as you can. And it's not too late. So if you are, unless you're a senior, in which case I'll get, get to that in a little bit. Um, but for freshmen, juniors, sophomores, literally everyone else, you have the time. So take classes, your upper division classes are important because they will be visible on your transcripts. Um, so pay attention to those and yeah, do your best. If you ever think you're not going to do as well as you want to in a class, reach out to the professors. They're usually very helpful. Um, back to our grad school thing. If you want to see if grad school is exactly right for you or it's something that you are interested in, you should talk to grad students. Coming to events like these or going to like more faculty, more um, department-wide events where you will have a chance to interact with grad students is a wonderful place. Um, they're a great resource. So SPS also holds a graduate student panel every, every year. And that's one chance you have to like talk to grad students, hear their experiences and hear about um, what it's like in being in grad school. Um, professors are also great. so. You can just ask them what, like, what is grad school like? How do I figure out what it, if it's right for me? And what are the main things to look out for in grad school? And they're usually pretty adept in like helping people out. What helped me the most was conferences, honestly. So I've been to a few conferences at through USC, but also through um, APS, which is the American Physical Society. They hold conferences like the March meeting, the um, Conference for Undergraduate Women in Physics. There's a bunch of events or sorry, there's a bunch of conferences where you will get to meet people in the field currently, how 
they went through graduate school, they went through undergrad. Um, and it's great to hear them talk because that's technically what you are doing PhD for. It's what you see as your end goal. You should um, attend as many as you can. Uh, I'm sure Beth will get a little bit into this as well, but yeah, I highly recommend conferences. And the physics department sends emails about these, but you can also look at APS website. All right, the undergraduate research I was talking about. Um, use your time at an undergrad institute as the time for exploration for the most part. Figure out what subfield you're interested in. There's a ton of research available at USC. Go to as many research labs as you can, or unless you, um, until you find like one niche uh, subfield that you're interested in. And don't think, so I'm jumping ahead, but explore as many fields, explore as many research labs. Don't feel bad to just go there for one semester or one year and just leave. You are doing this to gain skills, but you're also doing this to figure out which area is perfect for you. And when I say that find out what you're interested in doesn't mean you're like locked in, you still have a chance to change further down and you still have a chance to explore more fields. You just have to find what you're interested in right now to gain that expertise or to just gain skills in that particular field. Another thing that's wonderful about research is you get to know the field and what are the current topics that are being worked on right now. So if you are in grad school, these are some of the topics that will come up. If they're in your field, you will have to know them. You will have to use them most likely in your research or use their results in your research somehow. So doing research with professors right now is wonderful to figure out what's happening in the field, but also just gain your skills. Right, uh, research as an undergrad at USC, we've done, SPS has done a undergrad showcase where we went a little bit into what is available at USC, some of the physics department clubs, but there's also local universities that's just because of geography, we're close to Carnegie, we're close to Caltech and JPL. Many of the professors at USC have ties over there. Um, so you'll see professors who are working with, um, at least I know a professor who like works at USC, but also was working at JPL. So talk to your professors and let them know that you're interested in research. So. I will get a little bit into this as well, but make connections with your professors because that's important. They will help you out with things like these. Um, so what I meant to say with this is that you don't only have to limit yourself to your undergraduate institute, even though that's the most convenient um, and it's most readily available to you because you are a part of the school. And if that doesn't satisfy you, you can always look at like other universities like Carnegie, Caltech, or JPL, just three names that I thought of, and talk to professors who have ties. Um, just off the bat, I know uh, Dr. Rhodes has ties in JPL, or there's people who are in the Viterbi uh, school instead of just Dornsife that work at JPL. So branch out as much as you can and that will help you find what your niche is. All right, uh, research experience for undergraduates are REUs. I will let Beth talk a little bit about these because she's had more experience with them. Hey y'all, I'm Elizabeth Zhou and I'm a senior majoring in physics and computer science. And this year I applied for physics and applied physics PhD programs. And previously I had done um, some REUs and so like REUs are through the National Science Foundation, the NSF, and these are 10 week summer research programs. And so these are at other universities across, across the country. And it's good to be able to work with a professor at another institution. So then 
since this will probably result in a recommendation that we could then use for graduate school applications, it's good to have a rec from professors at another school to be able to offer another perspective. Students typically do RUs the summer after their sophomore or junior year. And then these are funded by the NSF. So that's also nice. And we can apply for RUs in physics as well as related fields like chemistry or material science. The applications for these open late fall and then the due dates are typically around January, February, uh, some into early March. In order to apply for these programs, we submit the statement of the research we've done, or if we haven't had research experience yet, to talk about like, classwork we've done. And then this involves two recs, and so it's important that we ask our recs early. And for me, I was able to do an REU the summer after my sophomore year. This was at the University of Texas at Dallas. And then I was, and then that was for superconductivity and quantum Hall effect and graphene. And then and it was a good time. And I have kept in contact with my with my professor from that from that summer. Yeah. Um they're wonderful experiences, like Beth said. So please reach out. Please look more into them. Um, okay. All right. So this is your first part that we're going to be going into uh, of the application process. Letters of recommendation. Um, make as many connections as you can with your professors. They are going to be your letters, of, like Rex. Um, it's really important to get strong letters of recommendation, which means these are people who know your research. They know your potential. They know um, your ability to overcome challenges, even if it's through classwork or preferably through research, right? And since we are in a, or assuming you're applying to a natural sciences um, program, it is most likely uh, beneficial for you to have a letter of recommendation from a faculty or a scientist of some sort. How to make those connections, I would recommend going to office hours, highly, highly recommend going to office hours outside of just joining research groups. Um, knowing professors and like letting them know you, even if it's to reach out and like ask about, is grad school right for me? Can I talk to you a little bit about it? Um, things like that. So. Any connection you make is def it's not going to harm you, basically. Um, yeah, so strong letters of recommendation are super important because they let the program know uh, an outside perspective, not just you telling them about yourself, but letting like a more experienced person tell them. Okay. Also, if anybody has any questions, just shout it out, we do have like time set aside, but yeah. Okay, application components, we'll be going over this very briefly because we have another workshop where we will go in depth into this, like what to write exactly, that kind of thing. All right, um, your main component to the statement of purpose, for, uh, main component for the application is your statement of purpose. It's what you use to summarize your research, your showcase your potential, literally everything. You have to mention um, what you're interested in, what professors you wanna work with, that kind of thing. Personal statement, like the word suggests, is a little more personal where you kind of explain your path to science or any hardships you've had to overcome to get to the place you are. Uh, CV is a longer resume, essentially. It's um, where you say literally everything you've done related to that field. So you've gone to conferences, you would put that in your CV. Um, you've presented at some talk, so you would put that in your CV. Um, like I mentioned before, your GPA is important. So that transcript will showcase exactly which classes you've taken, how you did in those classes. And if you're taking classes right now, they will have that little asterisk where they like mention it was taken during the pandemic. So it's a little bit different. Um, 
But yeah, so your transcript will be sent to your program. And usually you need three letters of recommendation. Some programs allow for more, but the bare minimum is three strong letters of recommendation. Also, don't, um, don't be shy to ask your letters, letter writers for a strong letter um, that just gives it more of an impact and you can provide them with what to, add, what to write. More on that some other time. Um, the last one is GRE scores. So this is the subject GRE for whichever subject you're studying and the general GRE. This application cycle was a little different. We had no GRE scores to submit. All the GREs were canceled. And there's a low chance of it coming back because most faculty have been opposed to like the scores not being representative of your research potential. So it's unlikely that it will come back, but in the low, low chance that it does, you would have to study for that. Um, in the in the year that you're applying. So summer of the year that you're applying. It would be, there's, okay. There's like three chances where you have to, in a year where you can um, give the subject GRE. So one of them will be in April, one of them will be in September and one of them will be in October. This I know of the physics GRE. And you have three chances. People usually give at least two First one is used as like a see what's happening in the test. And then the second one is the actual attempt. Um, you can choose which attempt to send to professors or to schools. And yeah. Okay. Uh, at this point, I think you will get in the chat, you'll find a list of programs for physics and for astronomy. Okay in a minute. Um, but there's also resources from a similar workshop where you can find what programs to apply to, what are the application process like, things like that. We will go more into it in the next workshop, but just as a very brief thing, um, you can go over the list of uh, like schools for astronomy and for physics and you can use this basically to evaluate which one you want to work with all right what are the things to consider if you are going to grad school and you do want to work with professors okay the very important thing is professors in the field so professors in the field that you're interested in at that school make sure it's not only one professor you want to work with because there could be a number of reasons they're not accepting students or, and that can ruin your chances to get into that program. So they could have a sabbatical or they're just, their lab is full or they don't have funding to take another student. There's many reasons. Um, so it's very, it's highly recommended that you have multiple professors you wanna work with at that school. But also um, once you have a list of schools, once you have a list of professors you want to work with, start emailing them just to see if you are a good fit for their research group, if you are a good fit for them and they're a good fit for you. That's very important because more than your skill or as much as your skill, grad programs also evaluate how well a fit you are for their program. And this is one way you can like get a head start on that. Um, I know I mentioned you should find a field you're interested in before, but say you don't have a particular field of interest. You just did a bunch of research and you liked it all or liked none of it. That skill still remains, but it's wonderful to have a program with a wide range of research fields for you. So that would allow for a little more exploration, but in a higher setting. Uh, to help you narrow down what you want to do if you are sure that research is the path you want to take. Other things to consider in a grad program is how many core courses you're supposed to take. 
what you're trying to achieve out of a grad program is your research, right? So you don't want there to be too many core courses where um, like seven is a high number, just to give a ballpark. Your main goal is to get research done. Um, so you should see how many core courses you should, that's to evaluate graduate life basically. If the program has, when does the program have a qualifying exam? What the qualifying exam is, it's basically a test in like your first or your second year, somewhere around that time, um, to check whether you're like, you know your basics well enough to go ahead with your PhD. You can again, talk to grad students about this. You can talk to, or look at their websites for the programs to check for each of these basically. And see when they have like details about their qualifying exam, details about um, core courses and things like that. Also important is when you can start research. Some institutes don't let you start actual research till two years after your PhD um, or two years into your PhD. Some let you start right off the bat. Um, so look again, talking to graduate students will cover most of this, but this is some research you'll have to do by yourself as well. Um, yeah, stipend. If you don't know this yet, PhD is paid. So you do get paid during your PhD. It will be funded through grants. And again, we'll talk more a little bit about funding, but it is funded um, and you do get paid. The pay is not very good, but it's still a job. It is still paid and your tuition is waived. So through um, things like these, like your professor's funds or your um, grants, things like that. Last but definitely not the least is location. This is usually overlooked, but you definitely want to see that it's a place where you're comfortable living because it is. if it is not a place where you can thrive at, there, I do not recommend going to that place. If you say are person who hates the cold and you've only applied to the east coast like that might be concerning considering things like everyday life you have to like live there for like four to six years and you have to do research and if you can't thrive in an environment you probably won't do very well so highly recommend looking into places that you're comfortable with and don't discount the last one That's all for me. Um, Beth is gonna be taking over. For funding, there are many different types of like financial assistance that we can get. For instance, we could get teaching assistantships and for that, we're expected to teach. And that would take up about 15 to 20 hours a week. And this could entail leading lab sections or discussion sections. And this also includes the time to grade people's homework. And this is a good experience for people who want to be professors down the line. We could also get funding through research assistantships. And this comes from a specific research group, it comes from like that faculty leaders, that faculty members grant. And with a research assistantship comes the expectation that we do research with that group, right? In addition to these assistantships, we can also get fellowships and scholarships. And while the assistantships ask for us to teach or to do research to then like give something in return. Fellowships and scholarships don't come with any like strings attached. They're just like, here you go, here is the free money. And so this is great. And this is, these can be sponsored by the department or by like federal agencies. And they have like different eligibility rules, different funding amounts and nomination processes. For scholarships that come from a department, there may be an additional essay that they ask for in the application, and this like varies school to school. For external fellowships, this is nice because then that means the group that you want to do research with doesn't have to pay for you. This makes it a lot easier for the professor, and then you get the freedom of then being able to look at different groups and having that, having that freedom and being able to choose without being dependent on whether a faculty has funding for the projects you're looking at. Getting a fellowship 
looks really good for you and the fact that, great, you applied and you got it. And it also reflects well on your school. And so schools really encourage their students to apply. One really established fellowship is the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship Program. And so this is typically due late October. And for application components, it involves a research proposal, a personal statement, as well as three letters of recommendation. We can apply twice for this. We can apply once in our senior year of undergraduate school, as well as once in grad school. And that would be the fall of our first or our second year. And they have like lots of specific cases for eligibility. So I highly recommend reading the rules um, to, to make sure um, whether we can apply or not. And this is only for, um, I believe, US citizens. Can we go to the next slide, please? Cool, thanks. For some common questions that we may be asking when applying for graduate school, um, can we change fields, right? We've talked to Professor Eli Levinson Falk with our USC department, and he said that like, no, professors aren't expecting their students to come in with the exact same experience that like lines up with their research group. And so for me, in my statement, I was talking about how I had research experience in condensed matter physics, but then I was interested in doing work with optics and photonics for one school or for another school, I said, I'm interested in quantum information. And so I changed this depending on the school's strengths or which professors I was interested in working with. I'm not at all suggesting to change it in a sketchy way, right? Um, but rather like to recognize that our interests aren't fixed. It's not as though we stumble upon them fully formed, but rather we develop them with time. And then once we're actually in graduate school, professors don't hold us to what we said in our research statement because they understand that that can vary um, and that no one's path is linear. If we do want to change fields, how do we talk about this in our application? For me, in my like, statement, I was saying, I was saying like, okay, I'm interested in this like, other field. And then I'm saying like, okay, how did I develop these interests? And so that could be through reading, uh, reading like, reading the current literature or attending seminars or talking with people who work in the field. That could be graduate students, postdocs, professors, or industry professionals. And so it's important to be able to show like, if we do want to change fields, to show that we've done our due diligence. As for publications, we do not need publications at undergrad in order to get into grad school. I do not, I do not have publications. Um, and then professors know that having publications isn't our like sole indicator of our worth, right? And that this is dependent on where our research group was at, or like depends on like fields. Some fields may have publications more often, whereas others have them less often. If we do have publications, however, and this is good to say in our research statement, and so we could say like, we have this publication, this title submitted to accept it at this journal. Um, we can also say we have like a manuscript in progress or this has been submitted for review. So like, it's not just like the finished product is worth saying, but also something that's like in progress is also okay to say. Uh, we've talked to Professor Peter Chung um, with our USC department. And he said that when he's evaluating applications, he doesn't care the name of the journal that someone's published in. It don't have to be like the biggest name out there. He just wants to know about the students' contributions. What have they actually like, done um, as opposed to just working with like a graduate student who like wrote everything, right? So it's important that he wants to see that the students understand why they're doing this project and what they've been able to contribute. Next slide, please. Dimple, can we go to the next slide, please? Oh, can you go back a slide? Yeah, sorry. Thanks, all good. For the faculty side of admissions, um, we've been talking with a couple of professors. For instance, Dimple was able to talk to Professor Rosa Di Felice, and she's the head of our head of graduate admissions for our USC department of 
physics and astronomy. And so she emphasized that the two biggest factors for admissions are grades and research. And if we don't have enough research experience when we're first wanting to apply, then we can do a gap year in order to get more research experience. She also suggested uh, looking into doing a PhD at a different place than undergrad. And this would allow for a new perspective, allow us to get access to new resources and connections. We we're also able to talk to professors from other schools since grad admissions varies from like department to department and like program to program. And so one professor I was able to talk to said that like when he's reading letters of rec, he's seeing if, if they can pinpoint a time when we did something beyond what's expected for undergrads. And so like that's important. Uh, that's important to tie in with what like Dimple had said, we want to get letters of recommendation from professors who really know us and can really speak to our work, not just say something vague like, oh, okay, she got an A in my class, but rather like here are specific interactions that we had. Here's a specific time when I saw her go above and beyond. As for COVID, um, COVID-19, how did this impact graduate admissions this year? Professors have said that like, they saw that students had less lab experience. This is, this makes sense, right? That like since last March, people have had less access to experimental labs. And so like people have had less lab experience, cool. And then like for me, I applied saying that I'm interested in experimental work, but then I, but my recent research experience has been on a computational project and they understand that. As we said, oh, mm, yeah. Um, for the jury, um, Dimbo said that like many schools did not accept it this year. They like explicitly said like, do not put your score in your, in your application and we won't accept it. Um, and the testing services didn't offer the GRE in the fall. And some schools did say it was optional though, in case students had taken it a previous year and wanted to include their score. One thing people were concerned about was the question of research funding, right? Like what if with COVID people have less resources and are able to accept fewer spots? One professor we were able to talk to um, said that they did receive more applications and and like this makes sense in the context of like if the job market is uncertain people may be like going towards academia right um but then for his school the research funding actually didn't go down it went up and he was saying maybe that's because professors had more time to write grants um this is just like one data point though so this doesn't speak to like a blanket truth for the future um, talking about like whether the GRE is going to come back or like in what form. Um, many schools already did not require it before this year. And so like of the professors we were able to talk to, um, they noted like, okay, their program didn't require it in previous years. And they also said that like, it's known that like the GRE as well as the standardized testing in general has diversity issues. Um, and on the flip side, they said that it can be a useful metric for students who come from lesser known schools, let's say like an international school where professors don't know how to gauge the, um, where like professors on admissions committees don't know how to gauge that school's standards or like what um, the rigor of their coursework. And this professor I talked to explicitly said that it's not like super necessary for USC because like the two of us were talking, right? So you knew when I go to USC and he was saying like, it's not super necessary because they know, they know what USC is like. And so that was good to hear, that was affirming. Another professor I talked to said, he, he thought the GRE wasn't useful and he'd seen bright students not do well on it. And so he doesn't put too much weight on it. Um, but these professors did note that some of their colleagues put more weight on it. And so this like varies from, from like professor to professor and department to department. Can we go to the next slide, please? For some final thoughts and some advice that I am very well qualified to give. Um, for me, I know like going into the process, I felt as though I just like wanted a school to take me, right? Just like whoever would take me, sounds great. 
Um, but then I was talking to a postdoc who said, it's not just that the students are wanting to go to like schools and work with professors, but also the flip side and that professors want good students and professors are considering how they can attract good students. And in hearing this, I was like, why, right? Why would they want me? And so I encourage you to recognize what you have to offer and recognize your strengths. Um, I think like this mindset shift uh, would definitely, um, it would definitely like, help you with like, I saw it definitely helped me in terms of like confidence and also like framing my story. In addition to this, um, I encourage you to be proactive and to go beyond the checklist of required components. As Dimple has said, it's important to talk with graduate students. There are lots of things that I wouldn't have known if I hadn't talked with graduate students, like emailing PIs, I would not, emailing professors, I wouldn't have known that that's helpful or even possible. And so good job to all of you for being here and for seeking out these resources. That's really important. And that like, and being, being proactive and showing initiative um, is a good skill that will help carry you through the application process and graduate school as well. And so like, not only can we talk to current graduate students, but I also recommend talking to recent graduates because they may not feel as like pressured um, when like talking about their professor or like the department and they can be more honest with you. And it's important to like talk with these students to, to gauge whether their professor treats their students well. For emailing professors, this is important because professors in a program get a say in which students they're admitting. And it's not like college admissions where I felt like I was just, I was just like facing these like faceless panels, right? But here for graduate admissions, it's important to email the individual PIs, the individual professors. Um, and we can like reach out to these professors, email them, email them and like set up Zoom calls. And in preparing for these Zoom calls, um, I suggest like looking through their work and being able to formulate specific questions about their research. Um, because then not only does that prepare us, prepare us in understanding what their research is, but it also helps to convey to them that like we are truly interested in them. Um, and then like that we're clever enough to be able to come up with questions and to be able to engage with them about their research. And we're curious. Okay, and then um, next we're going to hear from John Nyman and he is a graduate student in, uh, he's a graduate student with USC's physics PhD program and he works with Professor Vitaly Crescent. Hey everyone. Hey John, yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming here. Um, Thank you. you can you tell us about your path? Sure, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, all the advice that's been given so far has been <laughs> very, very good. And I, I guess I tried to uh, apply that when I was applying to graduate school all this time ago. And I, I give most of the same advice when I have a chance to talk to people who are interested in going to physics grad school. Um, and for me, the I, I took a relatively traditional path to get to graduate school where I am now. I, I'm currently a fourth year with Vitaly Crescent, And uh, I know Beth because she also works for Vitaly. So we've um, done research together for some time. Um, but my path started um, with majoring in physics. I went to Occidental College, um, which is in LA. Um, so I, I've been in the area for quite some time. And I, I studied physics there, um, and minors in math and computer science, which I think is fairly standard, um, or at least to have like semi specializations in physics like that. Um, and while I was an undergraduate student, I really um, wasn't thinking very hard about going to grad school initially. Um, it wasn't really something that crossed my mind. I kind of figured that I would get a physics degree and then do work kind of tangential to either um, computer science or engineering, maybe eventually doing a master's degree in one of the two or something along those lines. Um, but the further I got into the physics program, the you know more I talked with the other students in my year and talked with faculty um, for the, with the classes I was taking and such. And I eventually, um, after attending some events kind of like this, uh, I decided I would apply to REUs. Um, and I, I uh, actually applied to graduate school with a pretty, um, I think, light amount of total research. I just did the single REU, which I ended up getting um, during my junior year. Um, so I only had like three months of research experience before applying to graduate school. But for me, that was enough to really have a strong interest in doing research. 
Um, and apparently it's sufficient to, to get into graduate schools too. So if you don't have a lot of research experience when you're applying, uh, don't sweat it. Just definitely make sure that you have some um, one because it's important to make sure that you actually like research if you're gonna devote a, a, you know, a number of years of your life to it. Uh, and then two, I, graduate schools will definitely want to see that you have at least some research experience or some propensity to, to do research um, because like, uh, like we've heard already, that's that's a massive component of graduate school. That is that is what you do in grad school. It's you know generate original research and eventually write a thesis. So I, I did this RU at the University of South Florida, and I did uh, work in experimental condensed matter. Um, and then when I got to my senior year, which is right after the RU, I was interested in applying to graduate school. But to be honest, my senior year was pretty stacked up, and I was feeling really burnt out. So I decided that I would take a gap year and just work for a year and kind of try and figure out what I really wanted to do. And I could always apply for graduate school in a subsequent year, um, which is what I ended up doing. So uh, I had a friend who was doing an internship uh, for a company in LA at the time. And um, he was doing like logistics for, um, for a company that uh, makes and sells furniture actually, which is a reasonably big outfit. And he asked, well, like, well, you're looking for a job. You want me to just like throw your CV in the stack? And I was like, yeah, sure, what the heck. Um, so he did, and I got a call from that company a couple of days later, and I had a couple of interviews over the subsequent two weeks, and then within like three weeks or so, I had a job offer from them. So a physics degree, should you not go to grad school, is also very employable, is one of the things that I learned. Um, so I worked for them for about a year, um, but as I was working uh, out of undergrad, I, I was really kind of bored with the work I was doing. I was doing uh, business analytics, which you know, had some interesting problem solving. I learned how to use like VBA and SQL and I did a lot of spreadsheet work and such, which was fine, but I felt that it was kind of low level and I would have been more interested in doing more difficult problems. Um, and I decided that, well, I could look for another job or I could apply to graduate school. And ideally if I get a PhD in physics, uh, someone will hire me to do more interesting work or more complicated work in the future, which after working for a year, I figured getting a job that's challenging was something that was very important to me. So um, I started applying to graduate schools and I ended up getting accepted to a few. Um, I did not contact faculty ahead of time, um, which as far as advice goes, it's sometimes very helpful to reach out to faculty ahead of time um, because it can make those connections early. Or if you use connections from like professors you had in undergrad to make connections with uh, faculty at schools you're interested in applying to, that's also very helpful. I didn't do any of that, but I did, um, once I was admitted to a few places, I heard from faculty members there. Um, and specifically, I heard from Vitali here at USC, um, and he and I had been in contact for a bit. And when I, um, I, I couldn't make the visit weekend formally, but I did um, come to campus because I was in LA and I, I met with Vitali and I met with one of his graduate students, um, which was very, very important. One, because meeting with the person you're planning to work for is really helpful, but then, also very important, meeting with the graduate students in the group that you're trying to join is extremely important because they will <laughs> give you a kind of an honest impression of what it's like to, to work in graduate school and to work for that particular advisor. So if you're interested in working for a particular group, I can't stress enough how important it is to talk to the graduate students in that group to see if it's like actually a, a healthy work environment and a, just generally a good experience. Plus you all ideally wanna like your coworkers in, in the future. So it's, it's a good way to gauge that immediately. Um, so after meeting with uh, Vitaly and Patrick, the graduate student there, I, um, I, I thought about things a little longer. I went to some more visit weekends and stuff, but I eventually decided on, on going to USC because I was really interested in working for Vitaly because I had those really positive experiences and I was interested in the research that he was doing. Um, so I accepted my offer at USC and Vitaly actually emailed me back right away and was like, hey, uh, actually, if you want, you can start research now. We have like a summer fellowship through USC that you can take. Um, and being bored with my job, I was like, that sounds great. I'll quit my job. And so I did. And I started at USC a couple of weeks later. Um, so that was kind of my path to, to start up in graduate school. And uh, it's traditional in the sense that I have a pretty standard background for applying, maybe a little bit light on research, but I, you know, I took all the physics coursework and did, did pretty well in the courses. And I did get an REU, which is a, a huge deal. Um, if, if you are intending to apply to grad school, I, I highly recommend the program. Um, but again, light on research, it was only, only three months or so. Uh, but then I, I did take a gap year and I 
as far as taking that gap year goes, I think it was a really good idea for me. And I think it's, it's kind of a, it goes to show that you can take a gap year and it's not going to be a problem for applying to graduate school, even if you're not doing something that's immediately, immediately relevant. Um, and that's, yeah, that's how I got here. So. <laughs> Thanks, John. Can you, can you tell us some more about the advantages of taking a gap year or going straight into graduate school? Sure. Yeah. So taking a gap year is nice if you don't know exactly what you want to do. Um, or it's really nice if you do know that you want to go to graduate school, but you feel like your application is a little bit weak because it gives you an opportunity to get research experience mainly. You can do what I did and get general work experience and, and maybe that'll be valuable as far as boosting your application, but maybe it won't be because it's not necessarily directly relevant. But if you can take a gap year and do research, that I think really helps you, it will really help you get into graduate school because getting more research experience is going to show that you're you know, more and more prepared to go to graduate school eventually. There's also um, like bridge style programs that will allow you to do research right out of undergrad um, in order to, well, with the intention of applying to graduate school right after. I know that um, uh, Los Alamos does one, and I think there's a handful of other like national labs that will do bridge programs like this. So if, if taking a gap year because you're say not ready to apply to graduate school yet, or you want to boost your app beforehand. If you do something like a bridge program or get involved with research at your undergraduate institution or anywhere else, that's a really, really good use of your time to boost your application. But of course, the kind of the con of taking a gap year is that when you go to graduate school, your first year, at least maybe a little longer, is going to be filled up pretty heavily with, with coursework. And the longer you get away from schoolwork, it's the harder it is to kind of reacclimate yourself to doing so. Um, a handful of people in my cohort here at USC took some time off um, beforehand and, you know, everyone acclimated fine, but it definitely, there's definitely a noticeable difference in how, you know, quickly you're ready to get back in the classroom environment if you come straight out of undergrad to graduate school or if you've taken some time off. So it's not particularly bad if you want to take a gap year um, to go back to school, but there will be a bit of an adjustment period, which is a little more challenging. For me, I think taking a gap year was really important because I don't think I was ready in terms of knowing what I wanted out of my life and just generally being ready to take graduate courses when I came out of undergrad, but taking that time to do something different, kind of assess my priorities and then, um, you know, take a little more time to put together a really strong um, graduate application, I think was a really, well, maybe taking a gap year really good for me. What would you say are the different reasons for pursuing a master's or a PhD? Sure, yeah. So um, if you're going to pursue a master's, that's uh, a totally fine option as well. Typically, a master's degree is going to have more of a just a professional connotation. Like you would, if, if you're a physics undergrad, a, a lot of people that I know um, who got physics undergrads went on to get, say, master's degrees in like computer science or some subfield of engineering, and then kind of joined the workforce shortly after, because a master's degree is going to be much, much shorter than a PhD, typically. A lot of master's programs will be between, be between like one and two years, whereas a PhD is four to seven, I think, with the average time being on the higher end of that range. Um, so a master's degree is something you'd probably want to pursue if you have a really good idea of what kind of work you want to end up doing professionally. And then that would be a pretty direct route to transitioning skills such that you can go into a particular field. Um, and that isn't to say that you need to get a master's degree if you want to do computer science or software engineering or engineering generally, um, though it may be a little harder to get your foot in the door at certain companies if you don't have um, experience directly in those fields. Um, so a master's degree is kind of a good way to supplement your, your physics education such that you can quickly transition, and by quickly, I mean on the order of like a year or two, um, into a particular professional field. Um, and then a PhD is definitely different. It's it's the, you know, less professional, more academic style um, of route that you would take. Um, and a PhD, getting going to get a PhD is a pretty big deal. And your motivation for going to get one can can range pretty drastically. For me, it's because I wanted to end up you know, solving more challenging problems and build the kind of analytical skills that I built as an undergraduate to solve those, those problems and eventually ideally get hired for um, a job that would challenge me and make me think a lot. Um, wanting to get a PhD just for the sake of giving a, getting a PhD is fine too. Um, although if, if that's kind of the route you're gonna go, you should make sure that you either really like research or really like, um, like physics 
and probably specifically that you really like research, which we've been kind of stressing this whole time. Another, um, if you want to also, if you want to go into like academia, like if you wanted to end up being a physics professor one day, getting a PhD in physics is pretty much required. Um, if you want to be like a, you know, proper academic at a research institution, or if you want to like, you know, be a senior, senior researcher at like a national lab or something, a lot of those jobs are going to require that you have a PhD in some semi-relevant area of physics um, or, or engineering or computer science, et cetera. So there's certain jobs that you really need a PhD for, although that, unless you specifically want one of those jobs, it might not, you know, that might not be sufficient motivation to go out and get a PhD. Uh, there's also kind of the note uh, that a master's degree is expensive uh, or could be expensive anyway. There are ways to make applying for a master's or getting a master's cheaper, uh, but a PhD in physics or in most STEM fields is going to be fully funded by the school itself. So if you're willing to stick around in graduate school a little bit longer, you can do it for free, which is, you know, pretty nice. Um, but as far as overall motivations, there's, there's a lot of different reasons to go and pursue a PhD and that's really going to depend on the person. So if you're, if you're really interested in doing independent research, that's to me, I think very much sufficient reason to go get a PhD, but you know, there are certain reasons that you'd have to have a PhD like for certain jobs in the future. And also looks like there's a question in the chat now too. Okay, so we say, we say that Chang Hua is asking, I wonder how did you do school selection apart from what programs and subfields you like? I mean, I don't want to just apply to 20 programs and see what happens. I feel like there's a need for applying to my reach schools, match schools and safety schools, right? But how do you find those schools? Because it's unlike college application, there's no SAT score to refer to. Jean, do you wanna start us off? Sure, yeah. So there are, um, a lot of resources online to determine kind of what, um, well, what tiers schools are in. I wouldn't really think a lot about rankings of schools when you're applying because I don't think that's as important as choosing like a subfield that you're interested in or a handful of subfields and then looking at schools websites and trying to find faculty members that are involved in those subfields. Um, Grad School Shopper is a really helpful resource to kind of like narrow down your search based on some search criteria. Um, so that's that's one option to narrow down your search. I, I use Grad School Shopper to kind of, you know, select a handful of schools or select like a broader handful of schools. And then I actually looked at all the websites individually and found faculty members um, that I'd be interested in working for. And the places where I thought, you know, I have a reasonable shot of getting into this place based on my like GPA and my research, my PGRE score, et cetera. Um, and there's also this list of faculty that I'm interested in working for. I would apply to those schools. And if I didn't really meet those criteria, then I, um, either set one of the schools as like, you know, this is a serious reach school or I decided not to apply. A lot of schools will also post rough criteria on their websites. Um, USC is one, for example, uh, where they post their, uh, like they post a minimum GRE score. It's not really a minimum because there's plenty of people in this program that have lower GRE scores than that, PGRE scores uh, specifically. But then a lot of them will also be like, look, you should have a GPA in physics or physics plus math or physics plus whatever that is like roughly around here. You have a PGR score that's like roughly around here. And that's also a pretty reasonable metric for choosing, you know, what schools it's worth sending an application to. But I think that the, maybe the most important thing though is, is looking ahead of time at which faculty work at the school that you want to apply to and making sure that you would be a good fit for these people um, and that they would their research is a good fit for you. Um, because at the end of the day, like you, if you're when you're applying to grad school, you want to choose an advisor that you're you know comfortable working for, and that does good research and interesting research that you want to be a part of, because that's kind of what it's all about at the end of the day. So, so yeah, I, I narrowed down my selection using first grad school shopper, then looking at all the websites, and then looking at, from those websites, like finding faculty I was interested in, but then also you know kind of looking like is this is this is it reasonable to apply to the school based on my like stats and being like my GRE and my my grades and my level of research experience, and then between all those things you can kind of make a combat like well a combination of those things you can you can choose which schools are worth applying to or that are worth interest you're, that you're interested in at least. I ended up applying to about 11 schools as well for reference. Simple. Do you have any thoughts you want to add about how you chose schools or advice you'd like to give there? I kind of went along the same way. Um, 
I went through a huge list of astronomy programs. That's where I wanted to apply. And then I went to their individual websites just to see what their program was like. Um, I also paid attention to location if it was somewhere I see myself living and how so I also paid attention to whether astronomy was focused on. So there is physics and astronomy programs, but there's also schools with only astronomy and only physics programs, right? They're separate. So I, I focused on mostly programs that had astronomy, just so I knew what I wanted to do off the bat, not um, have to take my core courses in both fields and just have a limited capacity of astronomy or physics people. Right. Um, and yeah, and I'm mostly focused on like professors. And I also spoke to a bunch of professors who I work with in the past, so like research professors, and asked for their advice where they um, suggested that schools were a good fit for me. Yeah. Thanks, so. uh, John. Can you tell us more about what the admissions process is like on the faculty side? Like, do they have a committee and/or individual professors coming in grabbing our applications sure so i think it's uh, and my information here is maybe a little dodgy because i haven't actually you know been on the faculty side of doing doing admissions but from what i understand from being in graduate school for a while and from talking to faculty is that typically a school is going to have a committee which is going to be headed by one or two people so just a small handful of the total faculty um that will end up you know, thoroughly reading all your applications and looking at your stats and trying specifically to pair you with certain faculty members that are at the school you're applying to. And I think a lot of a lot of the game that is played for for admissions in physics is who's applying this year, what are they interested in, who do they want to work for, and then the kind of caring capacity carrying capacity there is that certain groups are going to have funding for students in certain years and not for others. So it's going to be it's like a you're trying to match your incoming students with who actually has availabilities to take students and fund them. Um, and then unfortunately, you would have to kind of re reject a lot of students who would be, you know, very much qualified, but may not have availabilities in certain groups at that school for that particular year. But as far as I know, on the faculty side, schools will do things very, very differently, like some schools will wait the PGRE quite a lot, or some will wait your, um, your previous research experience quite a lot. And then th that that weighting also comes down to, well, which groups you're going to get into because it depends on the, the particular faculty that you want to work for and how seriously they're going to weight all these things if you say that you're interested in working for them. But I think essentially people who have open slots will be in contact with the admissions committee and they'll be, the admissions committee is going to be, tr is going to be trying to pair incoming students with faculty members that actually have availabilities in their groups, which is one of the pretty big benefits of reaching out to faculty in advance such that you can kind of, well, make that connection such that they, when they see your application, they're like, oh, cool, I talked to this person, I want them in the program, I'm gonna tell the admissions committee to like let this person in or to heavily consider their application anyway. Um, so making those connections early can be, can be quite helpful as well. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of the meat of it. Thanks, John. How does funding work in graduate school? And I know that you applied for NSF Graduate Research Fellowship Program in your second year of grad school. So can you tell us what that was like? Sure, yeah. So funding, like, like uh, has been said in the previous presentation, uh, is going to come from a few different sources, either an, an RA, a research assistantship, a TA, which is a teaching assistantship, or a fellowship, which some schools will just offer you fellowships, um, USC being one of them. Um, I think a large number of students in the, in the incoming class are offered a, like a year of fellowship, which is a year where you have your own funding and you have a lot of flexibility in what you do because you don't have to teach. And technically you can use your fellowship even before you're in a particular research group, which is really convenient. Um, so, but when you're guaranteed funding from a particular school, you're gonna be funded, guaranteed funding through one of those sources. So in the worst case scenario, you're well, guaranteed that you'll have a, a teaching assistantship or a, a teaching teaching job while you do research for the whole time that you're in, in the graduate program. Um, and then the TA, at least at USC, we have graduate students that um, the majority of the time spent on the TA is, is giving lectures for the labs and kind of overseeing the lab courses or lab components of the courses here. Uh, and then 
a lot of the remaining time goes into grading various things for various classes. So all those homeworks that you turn in and spend a lot of time on uh, are, are graded or they're hand graded by one of the, the graduate students that's uh, hired as a TA at USC. Um, and that takes kind of a tremendous amount of time. Although if you have a TA ship, I think at most schools or at least at USC, the, the kind of maximum hours you're expected to work for a TA if you're fully funded by a TA is, is 20 hours per week, which leaves another you know, 20 hours or so for, for coursework and, and research um, traditionally. And then a research assistantship is an alternative to a TA, which you get if your advisor has money and wants to you know, essentially pay you to do more research and not have to teach. So typically, if, if you're in an experimental group, your advisor is going to be a little more inclined to pay you an RA just because doing lab work takes a lot of time and it's difficult to do big chunks of lab work if you're getting called away to teach periodically. And typically, experimental groups just have a bit more funding because it's kind of how, how grants and, and getting funding from organizations like the NSF or the DOE or the DOE, DOD, et cetera, work. Um, so the RA is just an alternative to the TA where you spend all of your time doing research, which is kind of what you're in graduate school to do in the first place. Um, so getting an RA is quite nice. And then a fellowship, functionally, once you're in a research group, is going to be quite similar to an RA, except instead of getting paid by your advisor, you're getting paid by the fellowship or you're, you're paying yourself through the fellowship. Um, and the yeah, the, the big fellowship that, that Beth was talking about is the NSF GRFP, which is a, a fellowship you apply for from, or you, you apply to the NSF for, which uh, pays for three years of your graduate school, typically at a higher, um, well, at a higher salary than you'd get otherwise um, at that particular school. And fellowships are typically very competitive to get. I think the GRFP has an acceptance rate of about 10% per year. And then there's a lot of other fellowships that have even lower acceptances than that. And applying for the, fel uh, applying for fellowships in graduate school or in undergrad is a really useful experience because it essentially has you put together an amped up version of your graduate school application um, where you need like letters of rec, you need a personal statement and you need a, a research proposal, which is one of the things that separates it from applying to graduate school in the first place. Um, writing a research proposal is something that's quite challenging and typically you need a lot of help from a potential advisor to do it, or at least a, a decent amount of help and some questions answered. And you need to make a connection with the faculty member if you're going to apply for it in the first place, because you're, you know, if you want to write a good research proposal, you want to make sure that you understand a faculty member's research quite well and that you have their support um, <laughs> as you apply for the GRFP. So that applying for it in undergrad, I think is, is quite challenging. I didn't do it myself, but if you wanted to do so, I think, one way to do that would be to reach out to faculty in advance and you know, try and communicate with them remotely such that you can write a strong research proposal and have them edit it, ideally have them write some kind of recommendation for you and then submit that application. But once you're actually in graduate school, you have the opportunity to apply again. And at that point, ideally you're working for a faculty member and can work closely with them to kind of translate their research or translate one of their previous proposals into a you know, a graduate student proposal that you would write and then and then submit. Um, writing, I didn't end up getting the GRFP, uh, but writing the application for it and writing a research proposal for my research was something that was very helpful because it kind of focused my research efforts or focused what I wanted to do as a graduate student. And it ended up being a really nice basis for my qualifying exam, which, which happened some time later. So I highly recommend applying for the GRFP, although I think applying for it as a senior undergrad is, is quite challenging. Um, and applying it for the first year in graduate school is also quite challenging because you're going to be busy. But I think if you apply for it, then you kind of have the best set of resources to write a good application. Since ideally you can be in direct contact with a faculty member at the school you're currently a graduate student at. Thanks, John. Also in talking to faculty um, who've been like reviewers for the GRFP, they've said that like, for since we can apply in our like senior year undergrad, first year grad school or second year grad school, it's not as though those three categories are like competing against each other. It's not as though like seniors and undergrad are competing against people with two more years of experience, right? Or two plus years if people have taken gap years, um, but rather like you're evaluated in your own category. And so in that sense, people have said that, like the faculty have said that 
you have like the highest chance of getting it in your senior year of undergrad because there are like the there are lower expectations there as opposed to a second year in graduate school who is expected to have like done more work and maybe like published more. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Feel free to like ask anything. I know Chris Matsumura and David Wynn have also applied for grad school like this admission cycle. Do you guys have anything y'all want to add? Any advice that y'all would have liked to know coming in? If we don't have any other questions right now, I'm going to drop my email in the chat and then feel free to email me, ask me any questions that you have um, afterwards. Okay, and then, and then we could talk later. Well, I'll, I'll drop my email in the chat too, if, if any of you wanna reach out since uh, I'll reach out directly. I'm happy to answer questions about applying. Thanks, John. I'd send privately to Chris though. <laughs> Let me try again. And thanks, Simple, for throwing yours in the chat too. Okay. Thank you all for coming out today. Um, this has been this has been fun. Yeah, and I hope you all learned something from this. Thanks, John. Thanks, Simple.